Hey there, it's Professor Bernstein, and in this video, which is the first of a two-part series, I'm going to be giving you more details about the model, the utopian or alternative communities that were springing up in the 1840s in America. I'm doing this because it will provide you with a richer cultural context within which to understand Thoreau's own experiment at Walden, and it will also eventually help us draw some connections between Thoreau and these communities in the 1840s to the lifestyle design movement of the 21st century. So as you discovered when you were reading Robert Richardson's biography of Thoreau, there was a great deal of tumult during the 1840s. He talks about how there was the Amer the English war with China, the American war with the Indians in Florida, as well as economic hard times and the less than desirable condition of the working classes and all sorts of struggles for um, women's rights and the abolition of slavery. Now the founders and members of these alternative, sometimes utopian communities really believed that there was another way, that we could live in a different way, and as Richardson says, that society could be reconstructed along better lines. Now, Richardson focuses mainly on Brook Farm, which I'll talk about in the next video, but since I'm making this video for those of you in my Thoreau class here at Lemoyne College in Syracuse, I thought we'd start with the Oneida community. Um, Oneida is really uh, Oneida, New York, it, where this community was founded, is really about just about an hour away from us. David Reynolds, one of my mentors in graduate school, wrote an award-winning cultural biography of Walt Whitman, who you probably know is a 19th century American poet, um, often known for his work, Leaves of Grass. And in here, he talks about how antebellum America, that means America before the Civil War, was an extremely fertile breeding ground for various religious and secular groups who practiced alternative lifestyles in an effort to put sexual relations on an entirely new basis. This was one of the goals of the Oneida community, which was founded in 1848 by John Humphrey Noyce. Noyce was a perfectionist, which meant uh, and this is a quote, this meant that he believed that God could not expect the impossible from his subjects and that the perfection he demanded was in fact attainable. Noyes also believed that we could attain the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And we, to do this, we had to sort of duplicate heaven. Right now I'm quoting from an article that appears on the University of Virginia's American Studies website. I just want to point out that this is a great, trustworthy resource. It has some good articles, but also full text um, copies of a number of great works of American literature. So it's definitely worth checking out. Most of the time when people remember anything about the Oneida community, it's really not their religious beliefs. It was their sexual ones. And at Oneida, they practiced what's called complex marriage which involved allowing both men and women to have multiple sexual partners. The idea of complex marriage was based on, according to uh, Noyes, it was based on Christ's teaching that there would be no marriage in heaven. So Noyes believed that on earth, all men were married to all women. The author of the article on the Oneida community points out Noyes felt that complex marriage moved the community beyond the traditionally divisive commitments to one partner or the family and raised this love and loyalty inherent in those commitments to the level of the community, just as he envisioned it in heaven. The Oneida community, like the other utopian communities of the 1840s, didn't live on forever but it does live on in one way. Members of this community supported themselves by making traps and chains and traveling bags, but most memorably, they made silver knives and forks and spoons, and that work 
formed the beginning of what is now the Oneida Silverware Company. So you've probably heard of Oneida, seen ads for the silverware, and that was really that Oneida community of the 1840s was really the beginning of that company. Now, another movement in the pre-Civil War era in the United States was the Free Love Movement. David Reynolds points out that the members of the free love movement really called for the abolishment of marriage and the re-establishment of relationships on the basis of passional attraction. Now, a lot of people, when they hear the phrase free love, they automatically think of the 1960s and hippies and sort of being really promiscuous. But as David Reynolds points out, the free love movement in the 1840s was a direct response to what was seen as the enslaving marriage institution. Free lovers, as he points out, did not emphasize promiscuity. Free love for them did not mean indiscriminate love, but love freely given, freely shared. The precondition for sexual relations should be love, not marriage. The basic assumption, as Reynolds points out, is that for them was that capitalism had poisoned heterosexual relationships, making marriage an institution of entrapment. And the free in free love, Reynolds points out, meant freedom to regulate sex according to true feeling rather than exterior social codes so that every individual heeded the inner call of his or her sexual voice. What does this all have to do with Thoreau? Thoreau did not belong to any of these movements. He was not part of the free love movement. He was um, not at all involved in the Oneida community. In fact, Thoreau, Emerson, and even Whitman were skeptical of reform movements, especially institutionalized reform movements. Thoreau, like Emerson, really believed that we had to start with ourselves, not with society. We really had, the work had to start with us as individuals. As we're As we're reading Thoreau, you're going to really start to see that he had issues and doubts about institutions and was really concerned about the effects that they had on us and the effects that they have on our freedom. So keep these issues in mind when you're reading him. Sometimes when you're first studying a new author or you're first first reading something for the first time or first seeing or experiencing something, you're really just focused on what's there and getting a grasp on what's in front of you. Um, and so it's harder to see what's not there. But sometimes what's not there, what's not happening, what's not being said is just as important as what is happening, what is being said, what is being experienced. One thing that you probably haven't noticed yet, but I'll just point it out for you, is that the issue of relationships between men and women, romance, marriage, they're conspicuously absent for the most part from Thoreau's writing. He never married. He did propose to one woman. He was very in love with her. And he was proposed to by another woman, but he never got married. He never had children. But nevertheless, uh, he did grapple with many of the same underlying issues. So what I want you to think about when you're reading Thoreau is what types of intimacy attraction and relationships seem to matter most to him? And why do they seem to matter most to him? Sometimes he's very explicit and says why. He articulates it in a direct way. But sometimes it's more subtle and you have to become sort of a detective and think about these issues for yourself and how they emerge and get worked out in his writing. Okay, that's it for this video. If you like this video, I would love it if you liked it. And if you're not yet a subscriber to my YouTube channel, I'd be honored if you subscribed. Um, And when you're ready, head over to the second video in this series where I talk about Brook Farm work and throughout.